with that introduction, I want to introduce Dan Doktoroff, who's certainly on the side of, 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 of what, what we're trying to do, who has the vision, vision to dream up design projects worth pursuing and great tenacity to make them a reality. Um, I was very proud to give Dan the, the, the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Medal in June in recognition of his career of service to New York, where he was, of course, deputy mayor under Mayor Bloomberg. Dan understands that good design is good for the city and it's good for the soul. It's not just about buildings. Throughout his tenure as deputy mayor, Dan planned for space for parks, transportation networks, and small businesses, and the resources of urban life that make our communities complete and resilient. Dan's contributions to the fabric of New York have, have become integral to our understanding of this, the, the, new, the new city. Um, Dan is closely associated with the development of Hudson Yards and the High Line, and, um, and Dan is, also, and I've had the privilege of knowing him a long time, a humanist, and he understands what a great space can do to transform an individual's experience of life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, thank you to the MAS for having me here for the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Award earlier this year, which was incredibly meaningful. And most importantly, for focusing the summit on this important topic. Um, last month, I took part in the ribbon cutting ceremony for New York's first subway station in more than a quarter century at Hudson Yards. Now, when we planned the extension of the number seven train, the far west side was a wasteland. In the 10 years before the plan was enacted in 2005, there were four buildings built in the entire area. During that period, tax revenues actually went down. We developed a novel plan to finance the $3 billion cost of the extension, new infrastructure, and open space that we believe would unlock the potential of Manhattan's last frontier. Well, if you take a trip over there today, you'll see that it is really working. 58 buildings have been developed in the last 10 years or started construction. Dozens more are in advanced stages of planning. For an out-of-pocket city investment of 353 million, total new net revenues after debt service from property taxes and related taxes out of the area for the city will be $30 billion over the next 30 years. That, by any standard, is an incredible return. Now, I bring this up because Hudson Yards has a powerful lesson for the future of cities. It's what I like to call the virtuous cycle of the successful city. Growth is good because the marginal revenues of that growth are greater than the marginal cost. And if the city uses those additional revenues to smartly invest in improving quality of life, the city becomes even more appealing, attracting even more residents and jobs, perpetuating that cycle. If we invest in this virtuous cycles, cities can accommodate the growth that is coming. And we all know that cities are growing at a phenomenal rate. Over the next 30 years, US metro areas will grow by 90 million people. That's nothing compared to what's going on in the rest of the world. In China alone, a half a billion people have moved into cities over the last 30 years. The good news is, that cities were made for density. But the point of this summit, of talking about the city we want, is that we can't just add millions of people to our cities and expect quality of life to remain high. The danger is, without transforming the way we build and manage cities, many will become victim to their own success. With high housing cost, enormous traffic congestion, and other urban problems. Now, there's nothing new about the challenges growth can impose. What is new 
is that today technologies are emerging to allow cities and citizens to tackle many of the biggest and most intractable ones, like housing, transit, and connectivity in new ways, by taking resources and sharing them more efficiently to improve quality of life. There are six big technological advances that are converging at this unique moment in time to make this possible. Mobile data networks that connect all of us, digital identity and reputation systems that enable trust to be designed into cities, location services that enable us to know where people and things are down to the centimeter, ubiquitous sensors embedded in things and systems that allow us to act before things happen, abundant computing power to handle much greater complexity and new design and fabrication technologies that will unlock new ways of designing and building things. That's why I partnered with Larry Page and Google to form a new company called Sidewalk Labs. Our hope is that Sidewalk will play a pivotal role in leveraging these new technologies to tackle those and other challenges and ensure that the virtuous cycle of the successful city continues by ushering in what I call the shared city. Let me give you three examples of what I mean. Ways that we can leverage technologies that allow us to share more effectively, to provide a higher quality of life with the same or fewer resources. Let's start with our buildings. For a century, American cities have been shaped by zoning and building codes. The rules exist to establish standards for what we can expect as, as we use buildings. At the same time, I think as we all recognize, zoning and codes are terribly crude. Zoning doesn't actually establish standards for behavior. It generally restricts how you can use a given building. This does ensure that uses are compatible, but it also makes real estate inflexible and therefore more costly and creates boring neighborhoods that often require you to get in a car and do things. Similarly, building codes often prescribe specifically how you can build things. It's all done this way because enforcement is hard. The neighbor who has parties can be just as bad as the nightclub downstairs, but it's never pleasant to complain to your neighbor. But what if technology could keep track of all of this for us? What if every building, even every room, could measure the noise being created, the smells being emitted, the activity going on at odd hours? And what if you could enforce against those violations in a meaningful, automatic way. If you could do that, you'd change much more than the way architects and real estate developers have to think about building codes. You'd reshape entire neighborhoods. All of a sudden, you could allow an apartment building to be converted into a nightclub, because what would be required was that the occupants simply complied with the maximum amount of noise permitted and people could choose to comply in whatever way made sense to them, where that was installing soundproofing or simply choosing to play only slow songs. Rather than lurching from industrial building to apartment building with all of the complex governmental intervention that was required, things could change much more seamlessly. Neighborhoods would be far more interesting because cities would focus more on being good neighbors than by separating activity. Another example of this is automated vehicles. Now, we've all heard of the benefits of AVs, greater throughput on the roads, fewer accidents, no wasted time behind the wheel. But there's also the point that AVs would likely help to complete the revolution that Zipcar and Uber have started. That is of viewing transportation as a service rather than as an asset. If the car can drive itself, you may not care to own it because it will be so much cheaper to share it with other people. 
For a city, this leads to a much bigger implication. You just don't need as much parking. Certainly, you'll need a place for the cars to charge and go and when not being used, but you don't need parking anywhere near the drop-off point, which means that your city just got a lot more usable space for the same or more transportation throughput. And that, in turn, actually makes the city more walkable because the distances will be smaller. And you can use that extra land for more open space or for greater density, all of which can provide new block patterns or even building types. One last example, here in New York. Sidewalk's first move over the summer was to lead the formation of a company called Intersection that is working with the city to launch Link NYC. And when I say we've worked with the city, I want to acknowledge Maya Wiley, who's counsel to the mayor, who has been incredible in, sh in sh helping us to make it through the various processes and to shape this project in a way that I think will benefit all New Yorkers. So what Link NYC is going to do is turn obsolete pay phones, all the pay phones in this city, into modern communication hubs. They'll provide shared, free gigabit Wi-Fi, free video and voice calls, and access to city services. They will blanket the city, offering New Yorkers and visitors a remarkable array of free services at no cost to the city. We will be bridging the digital divide with the fastest internet in the country, available for free on virtually every commercial street in the city to everyone by transforming our most, most outdated infrastructure into our most modern. And they will provide 10 times the revenue to the city compared to the old payphone franchise. Real kudos to the de Blasio administration. What is common in these examples if they let, is that they let us accommodate more people at lower cost and provide better quality of life with the same or fewer resources. Fundamentally, they are all about using technology to share better. Shared street furniture, shared vehicles, and shared spaces that are more flexible and responsive. That is the hidden story in all of these stories of urban innovation. We all know that there are great risks to these kinds of changes. We have a responsibility to make sure that it is done in a way that maintains our quality of life, protects our privacy, keeps us safe, and addresses equity. But I am a complete optimist that growth can be channeled to produce the revenues that cities need to provide services, to make quality of life better, and to make cities more equitable, and thus to achieve true sustainability, that we can help keep the virtuous cycle going even as we experience record growth. There is, we can all agree, an enormous urgency to get this right. And the good news is, is that with the technology we have, or will have shortly, it is within our reach. Thank you.